So first of all, uh, welcome to our um, Game Change, EC Game Change Seminar, the new series. This is the eighth talk in the series on, um, on habitability from galactic to microbial scales. And I'm very happy today to uh, welcome uh, Thierry to Dr. David, and he will talk about um, space weather, space climate and habitability on Earth. And uh, Thierry Dudoc de Vic is a professor in solar and terrestrial physics at the University of Orléans in, Fran in France. He did, by the way, several long time ago, or several years ago, his uh, PhD in Switzerland at the uh, Polytechnique Federal in uh, Lausanne. And uh, his interest, science interests are very broad. It goes from fusion plasma to fluid turbulence, followed by dynamical systems and now solar terrestrial uh, physics. And today he's deeply involved in the Parker Solar um, Probe mission as mm -hmm. instrument, uh, as instrument co-leader. So uh, Thierry, we are very uh, eager to listen to your talk. And before you actually start, I would like to mention that uh, at the end of the talk, you have two possibilities to ask questions. Mm -hmm. One is to raise your hand and uh, we will unmute you. Or the second is to write your question down in the chat and then we will read the question to, um, to Thierry. So thank you, Thierry, for having accepting, accepted to give this talk. And uh, we are all now eager to listen to your talk. Okay, thank you, Maurizio. It's my pleasure to be here. And it's an honor. So let me just um, switch to my other screen. And there we go. And hopefully okay. it should be okay now. Good. Okay, Good. Let's start here. So first of all, I should maybe apologize because it's it's a daunting task to address both space weather and space climate and climate in general in one single talk. So I'm not sure that I will be managed, I'll manage to cite everyone I would like to cite and cover everything I would like to cover, but okay, let's try to do the best. <laughs> Um, a few weeks ago, I, I just tried to ask my students what they thought about uh, this title and what came to their mind. And the first image that came to their mind is this, that the, the earth is not only a source of life, but it's also a menace. <laughs> and that um, a major flare could possibly de destroy life on earth. So this is one aspect of habitability because we're talking about habitability here. Um, I would like to, to address a different uh, topic. So recently there was another EC talk given by um, Tamita Skov in which she spoke a lot already about space weather. So I'm not going to talk so much about space weather. I would like to put more emphasis on, on climate. And I think there are two aspects of habitability uh, involved here. Um, one is uh, how can we live on a planet uh, with nearby star and what is the influence of the sun on climate? This is the obvious question I'm going to address. The, the other question I would like to address first is um, there's another aspect of habitability, um, which I think is important, um, which is that some people are today in a almost total denial of science. And to me, this is another risk for habitability, maybe even a larger risk, um, because these people, um, some of these people may cause our, our climate to go in, in the wrong way. And by the way, I'm not sure these are really scientists because uh, space scientists normally write uh, the sun with a capital S, but okay, I'll skip those details. So first from a basic fact, um, Physicists like to start with the, the big chunks and then go into the details. So the big chunk here is that almost 100% of the energy that we receive on Earth comes from the sun. So the sun is the, the obvious culprit if you want to investigate possible changes in, in, uh, in the Earth's climate. Actually, it's very interesting to look at the, the remainder of the, these few percent here, but that's another story. And surprisingly, this topic has received very little attention until a seminal paper that was given, written in 1976 um, by John Eddy about the mound of minimum, this period a few centuries ago where climate supposedly was colder and the sun supposedly was uh, quieter as well. And this has 
created a lot of interest. I think this is still one of the most cited papers in the Sun Climate Connection. So I'm going to, to speak a little bit about this and we're going to revisit it at the, at the very end to see if really the mountain minimum had an impact or a connection to our, to our climate. So as I said, the culprit is the sun. So uh, you should start uh, by, by looking at the sun. If you look at the sun in visible light, I'm sorry, this is, may seem very obvious for many of you, um, but I'll start from the very bottom. Um, if you look at the sun in visible light, you can see, if you're lucky, a few sunspots. And these have received a lot of attention because people have been counting them for, for centuries now. Um, but otherwise the sun looks pretty boring. Now, if you start looking at it in, in ultraviolet light, normally you, do, you shouldn't see anything at all if it were a black body, but you do. And it's highly structured and it's highly dynamic. There are lots of things to, to be seen. And this is fascinating because this brings us very close to, to space weather. But okay, let, let's, let's go back to, to the sun in visible light where you see these few sunspots. And the key physical quantity here is the magnetic field. Everything starts from the magnetic field. And this is something we can measure. When I say measure, it's actually the projection, the line uh, average intensity of the magnetic field on the surface. And this is what it looks like. So you have black and white uh, opposite polarities associated with these sunspots. That's well known. One of the major challenges today is how to measure the magnetic fields um, in the solar atmosphere in the so-called corona. And this is something we don't know how to do, or at least it is extremely difficult. And the best we can do is to use models like this one. It's a simple uh, PFSS model, but they are not very accurate. And this is indeed really crucial because uh, the topology of the magnetic field is going to tell you a lot about the, the variability, the dynamics of the solar corona. And this is illustrated in, in this um, um, small uh, movie, which is taken in the ultraviolet by the AIA satellite. And you can see a flare occurring here close to the limb. And of course, this flare is associated with the release of magnetic energy, which is converted into kinetic and, and also thermal energy. So magnetism is, is the key here. So fortunately, people have been counting sunspots um, for, for many centuries here. And among the first people were Galileo, but there were lots of other people, Staudacher, Wolf, Wolfer, and, and many others. And this has given rise to the longest natural record we have in science. It's a fascinating record. And I would just like to mention, whenever you see a small EC logo at the top, it means that the EC team has been working on that, or a very dedicated EC team. I was lucky to be part of that one, where we were trying to stitch together all these historic observations of the sunspots. And that there's one striking thing, is that there has been a long minimum, around 1650, 1715, something like that, followed by a weaker one, which is called the Dal Dalton minimum. So the first one, that's the famous or infamous um, Mounder minimum. Um, which seems to coincide with a period during which weather was colder, or at least cooler in Europe. I should say wetter, there was more rainfall. And this arguably was, may have led as well to a series of revolutions. So there was a connection to, to history as well, which is interesting. And one of the big questions I'll come back to at the very end is, is there any connection to the Little Ice Age? I'm not going to talk about the mini ice age, which is also something has, that has been observed, at least in the Alps. But the Little Ice Age has been widely documented, and people know that glaciers were uh, advancing faster during that period. So let's, I'm going to try to, or at least to attempt to disentangle these different effects to see what could be the, the impacts and what are the mechanisms, what is the physics behind all of this. And uh, physicists like to decouple things into different parts. So I'm going to do the same. And if you look at the sun and the earth, there are, I would say, four different means by which the two can interact. One is uh, electromagnetic radiation, which is called a solar constant because people thought it was constant for a long time. And it's typically 1.3 kilowatt per square meter in terms of energy density. There's also the solar wind, or perturbations of the solar wind because it's not steady. 
this is basically a plasma. And you can already see that in terms of uh, energy density, it is about seven orders of magnitude below. So normally you would think, well, if it's that weak, you could just as well ignore it and focus on the, the strongest one, especially with seven orders of magnitude. Um, one part of the plasma is made of much more energetic particles, mainly protons, but also electrons. And again, you see the energy density is extremely weak, so you could just as well ignore it. And finally, there's one additional component, which comes from the, uh, the universe itself, not from the sun, but it is modulated by solar activity. And these are uh, galactic cosmic rays, which are particles and not uh, electromagnetic radiation. So I will, I will go through each of them one by one. And I'll start with the, the, the largest one, of course. This is the obvious thing to do. So the amount of electromagnetic radiation we receive at Earth, um, this is called total solar irradiance or some people still call it solar constant, uh, we honestly. And it's about 1.3 um, kilowatt per square meter. And this is something that has been measured now since the late 1970s. And what I'm going to show here is this time evolution of the TSI since 1978. Uh, it's measured on a daily resolution and the red curve is just the uh, yearly average. Well, you can see this very conspicuous 11 year cycle. Uh, associated with sunspots. So when there are more sunspots, the TSI is, is higher, which is a little bit counterintuitive, but okay. I will not go in detail. I think the key point here is, is the relative am modulation amplitude, which is uh, about a tenth of percent. So it is, it is measurable, but it is extremely weak. And so weak that if you turn this into using a simple black box, uh, um, uh, uh, not black box, sorry. <laughs> black body approximation, you can convert it into temperature change. And the temperature modulation you get is not zero, but it is small. I mean, small compared to um, um, uh, um, climate uh, variability. And here, I would just like to make a short interruption to tell you, to show you how difficult it can be to, to get those results. The data you see here come from about uh, a dozen different spacecrafts, each of which has problems and has a lifetime of typically eight, nine, ten years, sometimes more than that. So this plot, which I got from Greg Cobb, shows you the different TSI measurements, measurements made by different spacecrafts, ERP, and later on the Primos, Virgo, and, and even more recent ones like here, like, like Thesis. And the first thing you can see is that they all disagree, <laughs> not only at the absolute level, um, but sometimes also the modulation amplitude. But if you stitch them all together, and I will not go into detail, lucky you, <laughs> uh, you eventually get a, a reconstruction of the TSI, which is used today for, for climate um, uh, modeling purposes. Now, the TSI, I would say, is, is actually a very bad quantity to look at because it's a global quantity and doesn't tell you about the details. So if you decompose the TSI into the energy density per wavelength, you get something which is much more interesting. And here I'm showing it um, for the range going from extreme ultraviolet, soft X-rays, extreme ultraviolet, ultraviolet, visible and infrared. And you can see that as expected, most of the energy is concentrated in a visible band. And these are measurements that come from the, the source spacecraft. So this is not a model, it's, it's a measurement. The, if, the, if the sun were a black body, uh, you would only see part of the UV and visible infrared and nothing in the soft X-ray and extreme ultraviolet. But we know it's not the case. The interesting thing here is, where does this radiation get absorbed in the terrestrial atmosphere? So visible and infrared, luckily for us, mostly comes all the way down th uh, through the surface and oceans. So it gets, it gets absorbed at the Earth level, zero level. But if you go to the UV, um, depending on the wavelength, you get absorbed at different altitudes by different uh, atomic species, like nitrogen, oxygen, and, and others. And you can see it's, it's highly wavelength dependent, which means that depending on which wavelength length you look at, uh, your absorption is going to take place at different altitudes. 
And this is very important because different altitudes have completely different dynamics, behavior, coupling, and this is the whole story. So if you look at the UV parts only, which is not very variable, um, this is mostly absorbed uh, around the stratosphere. So this leads to the formation of strat uh, stratospheric ozone. So it's a production of ozone. If you look at shorter wavelengths, these get absorbed much higher up. And these are important for uh, satellite drag, uh, radio communications, and so on. So you can see there's a connection to space weather, um, short-term variability, but also connection to climate because uh, the accumulation of ozone will in fact impact the, the radiative balance of the atmosphere and in this way impact climate. So I would like to describe more in detail just one of the mechanisms. There are different mechanisms, but just one of these by which uh, the UV, very solar variability in UV band can impact climate. And I find it an interesting example because it's, um, it evolves many different steps. So if I take a simplified plot of the Earth's atmosphere, uh, this is the temperature profile with inversion um, here above the troposphere, so the tropopause, then you have the stratosphere, and again an inversion, and then it gets, um, it, 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 it changes like it, it gets cooler. Um, these inversions are very important because they create kind of barriers, especially the, the tropopause here. So um, if you have visible light reaching the earth, it will reach heat the surface and you will mainly affect uh, the, the troposphere and the climate variability in the lower layers. On the other hand, if you have UV radiation, um, this is going to be absorbed higher up near the stratosphere and mostly at the equator, of course. And so you will generate ozone, which is going to affect the well, the whole dynamics, I would say, of, of, these, of this layer. And this ozone will migrate to the poles where there's less ozone, of course. And as it turns out, in the polar region, you have a vortex, which is a quite isolated region, which plays a very important role in separating the dynamics of the, the polar region from uh, uh, lower latitudes. And this vortex is bounded by the well-known jet stream at much lower altitudes. And as it turns out, the shape of this jet stream can be sometimes circular or sometimes much more wobbly like it looks here. And the difference between the two really depends on the dynamics of the ozone in this region and how it enters uh, the polar vortex. So basically, depending on the level of UV, you're going to affect the ozone layer, which is going to affect the jet stream. And here, the important thing is that this jet stream is going to have an impact on, on the weather patterns in Europe. And actually, it's, it's, uh, it's interesting because uh, right now in France, today it's, temperatures are okay, mild. Tomorrow we are expecting snow here because one of these meanders is going to stagnate right above Europe and bring a lot of cold air coming from Scandinavia over Belgium and even France. And there have been a couple of studies on that. A famous one was by Innocent et al, but there have been other ones. And this is showing that if the sun is quiet, um, the jet stream is meandering much more. And so you're more likely to have spells of cool and dry air coming from uh, polar regions. And if the sun is active, you're more likely to have a, uh, how could I say, uh, a straight jet stream, which is going to bring um, wetter um, weather in, in, in Europe. So the interesting thing here is that this is mostly going to have a regional impact. And I think that's really one of the challenges to our way of thinking. We always think that the solar variability will impact climate as a whole. And this is not necessarily true. So here we clearly have an impact, this is, which is mostly regional, even though um, the UV affects the whole uh, sunlit surface of, of, of the Earth. The message I would let, like to get through here is that um, the contribution from the UV, the UV represents only a few percent of the energy radiated by the sun, but it's much more variable. And because of these mechanisms, it has a leverage, which is quite significant. Actually, in terms of order of magnitude, it is hard to quantify, but in terms of order of magnitude, it is comparable to the remaining 95% because of this leverage and the regional impacts. <clears throat> 
Okay, I'm going to stop here and leave this uh, electromagnetic part. Let's move to particles. And first look, let's look at the, 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 the bulk of the distribution of particles, the thermal ones, the, the plasma, the, the solar wind. In the last few years, um, we were lucky to have a bunch of spacecraft that made wonderful measurements, um, not only SOHO, but also Stereo here, and now Sorabeta and Barker Solar Probe, and which have really changed our view on this solar wind, which is a supersonic stream of plasma leaving the sun. And here I would like to um, pay a short tribute to Eugene Parker, who passed away a few weeks ago, and who was really a key person in, in, uh, in describing the, the dynamics of the solar wind. So the, the twin so, uh, stereo spacecraft um, went around the sun like that and made wonderful stereoscopic images. But in particular, they were equipped with a so-called uh, chronograph that observes um, the interplanetary medium between the sun and the earth in visible light with a very high contrast. So you, the, the sun is, um, is occulted. And what I find fascinating in this movie, which I'm going to play twice, is uh, this movie was made in 2007. This was a small comet, Comet Anchor, which was, was approaching the sun. And first of all, you can see the solar wind. You can see these bubbles of material. Basically, this is the electron density, which you're seeing here. And here comes the comet. And look at the tail of the comet. At some stage, the tail is going to be cut off um, by these uh, bursts of, of solar wind. So you can imagine that as the solar wind is approaching the Earth, if you have a burst uh, with higher velocity, higher density, or more REM pressure, this is going to compress the Earth's magnetosphere, which ideally looks like that, but this is a very simplified picture. So the solar wind, which is following these magnetic field lines, is going to compress the magnetosphere, and so by Maxwell's equation, you get you are going to generate currents. And these currents convert magnetic energy into kinetic energy, and by this, I mean that you're going to have particles accelerated, mostly coming from the tail and precipitating in the, in the atmosphere. And this is illustrated here um, by these two pictures taken two different days um, by Sampex, where you can see the, um, uh, the concentration of energetic electrons, which are precipitating the atmosphere uh, near, near the poles. And this has very interesting consequences in terms of space weather, of course, but also in terms of, of, of climate. So just a quick word about space weather. Uh, when these particles, and not only these particles, but also particles which are stored in the, in the geomagnetic field in so-called uh, Van Allen belts, um, these energetic particles are stored there in a reservoir and they can stay there for weeks and, and for months. And there is a well-known region above Brazil, which is called the South Atlantic Anomaly, where these radiation belts are a little bit closer to the Earth's atmosphere because there's an, the, the, the magnetic field is off axis with respect to the, um, the Earth's uh, spin axis. And this is well known because as spacecrafts go through this region, um, they suffer from more impacts from these particles, which cause memory upsets. And it's also a, a hazard for, for astronauts if they're going to do um, extravehicular activity. From a climate perspective, it's also interesting because these particles, uh, this is a plot I took from Annika Seppele, which is showing you um, at what altitudes the ionization rate is depending on different particles that can precipitate in the Earth's atmosphere. Uh, so you have UV radiation, but this is not what I'm talking about. You have um, different species, so protons get much deeper into the atmosphere, and then you have uh, galactic rays, which I'm going to talk about a little bit la later. So I think the key thing to remember here is that depending on the type of particle and the energy, you get absorbed in different layers of the atmosphere, and these can have completely different impacts of, of, the, of, the, of the dynamics. And finally, let me mention something which is more exotic or less explored, I should say, um, which is the electric circuit. So 
this this highly conductive layer around the Earth, which is called the ionosphere, um, and the Earth itself can be compared to a huge capacitor with about 100 kilovolts between the two, isolated insulating layer. Well, it's not totally insulating because there's um, a fair weather current, which is of a few pico amps, which is going downwards all the time. And this current is restored by, um, by um, thunderstorm activity. And one of the mechanisms that has been proposed is that if you have um, a burst of solar wind, this is going to compress the, the magnetic field, geomagnetic field, which is going to affect the, the current density and change the downward current to the Earth. And this could have an impact on, on aerosols. I mean, I mean, anything that is sensitive to electric field. So aerosols and tiny water droplets. And eventually this could have an impact on climate. So I will not go in more detail, but it's just to show you how many mechanisms and unexpected mechanisms can, um, can have an impact here. Okay, um, two more to go. Um, number three are again particles, but more energetic ones. And these get much deeper into the atmosphere. These are mostly protons and electrons. Um, produced directly by the sun when you have um, major solar flares. And I'm going to illustrate this with one of those chronograph movies where the sun here is occulted by a, a disc. And this is of course accelerated and you can see uh, a lot of activity with bursts of plasma uh, called so-called CMEs uh, going off. And sometimes you can see a little bit of snow on these pictures and these speckles are impacts of any energetic particles, mostly protons, um, on the screen of the, of the camera. And these protons are a hazard, especially for astronauts. So here just saw one, which was more intensive, and they come and go. They are highly, highly intermittent. You can have uh, months without any, and then suddenly several in a row if the sun is, is more active, which is precisely the case um, in these, these months. So, Interestingly, in 1972, between Apollo 16 and 17 missions to the, to the moon, there was one of these bursts, um, which was strong enough to have killed an astronaut if the astronauts had been in space. So it is really a hazard um, if man wants to, to be for a long time in space or move to Mars or, or whatever. And why is it so? Well, I'm not going to, to really detail everything, but the reason is that these particles, they penetrate uh, everything, semiconductors in particular, and they can call, uh, create so-called um, deep dielectric discharges, charge accumulation, uh, which can disrupt or even destroy uh, semiconductors. So you get memory upsets and you malfunctions, and sometimes even a satellite can be wiped away. The big question here is, can such a sort of flare be strong enough to wipe away life on Earth? And I don't think we have a real answer. There are strong indications showing that the sun as a star is not able to produce flares, or I should say energetic particles that are with a fluence that is large enough to be a hazard. Um, there's no major impact on, on climate either. However, what we do see is that some events that occurred in the past can leave a signature in um, cosmogenic isotopes, like this one, which was recorded in ice. You see an increase in uh, carbon-14, also in barium-10, for example. And you see the same in, for example, in meteorite fragments on, on the moon, which are directly exposed to, to um, solar activity. And so it's interesting to see that by looking at ice cores, you can go back into the history of, of solar activity. Actually, it's a very important uh, trace of, of solar activity. So again, coming back to habitability, uh, could this have an impact on life? Uh, we don't think so. We've never seen evidence so far, um, but it's a real important physical question to, to determine how strong a solar flare could be, because these flare are dis flares are distributed in a power law, and so large events get rarer and rarer, flex ones. Finally, number four. Um, so these are collected cosmic rays, and basically 
uh, helium nuclei and, and, and protons. They have nothing to do with the sun, um, but their flux is modulated by solar activity. And why is that so? Because when the sun is active, uh, the magnetic field offers a stronger shielding and it's also more turbulent. So these particles are scattered away more efficiently from the inner heliosphere where we are kind of protected by the sun. And well, some of you know this very well, <laughs> these galactic cosmic rays have been hotly debated um, because one of the mechanisms that was proposed uh, almost two decades ago was the following is that if you have an active sun, um, these particles get deflected away. So fewer particles are entering the, the atmosphere. When they enter the atmosphere, they produce uh, uh, shatters of, of particles of all types, uh, sometimes exotic particles. And so these showers of particles are less frequent when the sun is active. And so they are less likely to produce uh, cloud condensation nuclei. And so you have a smaller probability to produce clouds and therefore higher temperatures. And I think one of the plots that really sparked this hot debate was this one uh, by Hendrik Svensmark. Um, this is a more recent version where he showed in blue uh, the cloud cover measured from different spacecraft and in, in, in red the cosmic wave flux. So one of the quantities is inverted and you see a striking correlation between the two. And so this led to an experiment, the cloud experiment that was carried out at CERN, which led to the conclusion that this mechanism indeed plays a role. It is measurable, but it's not strong enough to have a significant climate impact. And incidentally, a few people have uh, carried this measurement further, in particular this, this paper, where you see again um, the cosmic ray intensity in red, and this, this time the cloud cover in blue and green with diff two different uh, ways of measuring cloud cover. And this time you see that uh, the correlation has completely disappeared. So again, it's, it's a, to me, it's a, it's, a, it's a clear lesson how careful you need to be when you, you're using correlations to infer uh, causality between those mechanisms. Okay, um, coming, Coming to the conclusion, so sorry, I'm, for those who know this field well, well, I'm sorry because there are lots of other aspects which I, I did not cover. I would like to finish with a few uh, more general conclusions. Um, first of all, this is a plot I like very much where you see all the connections between different mechanisms and the sun and, and the earth for space weather. And this is really how our system looks like. It is, um, it is a highly nonlinear system with lots of uh, interconnected mechanisms. And the only proper way of looking at it at this is not by dissecting the whole system because sometimes it's just impossible. You really need a systemic approach. And that's something we, I think that was one of the major discoveries of the people working in space weather is that the interest is shifting from the processes or from the individual regions to the connection with the connections between these regions and this is really what matters here and i would also like to pay tribute here to the uh, um, to the famous report by uh, dennis and donella meadows in 1972 where they did a similar approach for understanding the variability of the earth's climate and with a growing population and already showed 50 years ago that um, humanity was going to face a major risk. Their time scales were not exactly correct, but their predictions, very dire predictions, actually turned out to be very realistic. And this is precisely what they did. They followed a very systematic approach. So coming back to this sun climate connection, I will give the last word to the IPCC report because I think it's it is, uh, well, it plays such an overwhelming role in collecting all this information. And also because there was an easy team where we produced some of, some of the data that led to these conclusions. In the latest working group one uh, assessment report that came out last summer, you have this plot where you see um, the, the change in radiative forcing 
observed today uh, due to greenhouse gases. These are these two uh, red um, rectangles. Um, effects which are due to pollution, aerosols, and lots of, lots of other terms which I will not mention. And here you see the contribution of the sun compared to the other ones. Um, I think what is important, there are two messages here. First of all, it, it is maybe not equal to zero, but it is weak and the error bar is huge. So it is not significant. I mean, people would say it's maybe 5%, 2%, who knows? The main message is that it is extremely weak and it's basically hidden in the noise compared to, to the other terms. But it is not equal to zero, not exactly. And I think there are open questions. I think uh, we should never be content with that. And there are still debates in the community. And I will just mention one of those questions which I find very puzzling. I, I'm not sure anyone has really given an answer to this one. It's an old paper written by George Williams in uh, 40 years ago, where he was studying verbs in, in, um, in Precambrian sediments, I think in Canada, but I'm not sure. Never mind. And what he sees is that uh, every approximately 11 years, there's a stronger a concentration of these verbs. verbs. And of course, when you think about 11 years, uh, you think about um, a solar cycle. But of course, there are also natural cycles in, in the climate system. And so this is definitely not a proof that the sun is acting on these on, on, on climate. But there are more examples of this type, which are really puzzling. And I think we, we don't have a clear answer yet. So to conclude, I'll go back to the to the mounder minimum. And remember at the end, I said that uh, the paper that has really revived the interest in this sun climate connection is this paper by um, John Eddy in 1976. And he basically said that um, during the mounder minimum, um, things were different. There were a lot less aurora seen and the weather was colder. Um, there were very few sunspots. So this is summarized in this spot, which, which I got from a very interesting recent paper, uh, which is cited, mentioned here. On top of this, basically, you see uh, a proxy for the number of sunspots with the mounder minimum, which appears here around 1680, 1700, something like that. And the reconstruction goes farther back in the past, not using sunspots, but using cosmogenic isotopes. The plot at the bottom reveals um, the global terrestrial temperature um, with different changes and, and lots of variations. And you can see that actually the little ice age, there's no clear definition for what is the little ice age. I think there's no consensus today. And you could say that the little, little ice age started in the 1400s and ended in the 1900s. Uh, and you could also say that the Little Ice Age was this 50-year period between 1650 and, and 1700. Um, so you see that from these curves only, there's no clear uh, causality. So I think we should, even though this paper by John Eddy was really instrumental in, in reviving our interests, um, this is not the end of the story. <laughs> so the mountain minimum definitely occurred right within the period of, of the Little Ice Age. But the timing is, is, can be debated. And of course, there are multiple factors. One of the factors is volcanic activity. But clearly now we have a better understanding and we know that, for example, changing land use could also have played a role. So um, this is not the end of the story, fortunately, and hopefully there's much more to come. And with this, I think I'll thank you. And if you have questions, I'll be happy to answer them if I manage to. So thank you so much, dear Thierry, for your excellent talk. And uh, now we have already uh, two questions in the chat. And I would like to remember again to all the listeners that you have two possibilities to ask questions. One is to raise your hand and you will be unmuted or to write the question in the chat. So uh, let's first go ahead with the chat. And then we have already two people um, raising their hand. So this is, I think it's a really more technical question here from Andrew, Andrew Lazarevich. 
how does or does the total electron content in the ionosphere affect the solar irradiance absorption or transmission? And then the second question is this uh, uh, tech clearly affect the RF transmission, but does it also affect X-ray or higher frequency solar radiation? Mm -hmm. Okay, um, so I'm definitely not an aerospace expert, but I would say, um, yes, in a sense that if you change the electron content, you change basically the ionization rate. So uh, you, you change the cursor between uh, a neutral atmosphere and an and, uh, ionized atmosphere. And this will impact the dynamics of your atmosphere. And it will also impact, for example, uh, the dynamics of your of your, your atoms or your molecules that are going to um, to um, to um, ah I'm, changing, I'm seeking my word to um, to be ionized or to to receive this radiation and be ionized by this radiation. So clearly, there's a connection. How sensitive it is, um, I would have a hard time saying here, but definitely there's a connection between the electron content and, and the two. But it's not something that has been really deeply studied, I think, because it's should play a minor role only. Okay, so now we have William Wall. He is raising his hand. Please, William. Hi, hi hello. Um, yeah, I just wanted to say I really loved your talk. It was, it was especially the way you uh, organized it. Um, the, uh, I was wondering about um, effects by, uh, say, supernova. And it's like in, in history, there have been mm -hmm. these historic supernova, like the, the, the producer Crab Nebula, like the 1054. Um, there would have been a flux of, of uh, well, <laughs> well, mostly photons, but um, I, I'm just wondering, is there any uh, indication that these supernovae had some kind of effect on the Earth's weather? Yes, there, there is a long list of different uh, events that has, and this list is, con is still continuing today. Um, one yeah, of sorry, the... One anything. of the big questions is if you see an, in, an uh, enhancement if in uh, concentration of cosmogenic isotopes, is the origin solar or does it come from a supernova? From the one I mentioned, which was 775 AD, um, I think there's strong evidence that it was due to the sun. And the other ones, I would have a hard time giving you dates here, but are the ones for which um, uh, events outside of our solar system are, 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 are the suspects. But it's a good question. And, and this, of course, affects the hardness of your spectrum, the, the flux as well. Um, nevertheless, um, these events, because they're much farther away, uh, are going to probably going to be much weaker. So the first you will see are definitely solar. But there are a bunch of papers on that. I think there are people like Ia Usaskin who can give a much more definite answer on that. <laughs> okay, thank you. Now we have one question in the chat, which is says, well, from Martin Heimann, thanks for the great talk. And then is the link between sun, ozone and AO, NAO only based on correlation or can it be shown to work in climate models? Ah, yes, the paper, I'm, um, the results, let me go back. Um, this one, oops, sorry, I went one step too far. And this work uh, by um, by the British team, Innocent and, and others, uh, Scaife and, and more, uh, they were using climate models. So I think the, the, the main progress made by this study is that for the first time, it was not just a correlation study, but they were showing using climate models that um, this impact on the polar vortex could have an impact then on, on, on the jet stream and therefore on, on, on the weather patterns uh, in different specific regions of, of the earth. So I think this mechanism today is, is well accepted. It's not a speculation anymore. It's, and it's not a, just a correlation study. <laughs> if this was your question. Okay, now we have one raised hand from Steven Spangler. So let's go ahead with his question. Please ask your question. Hello, Terry. This is Steve Spangler from the University of Iowa. Nice, uh, nice talk. Um, I noticed in your talk you referred to the 780 of the Common Era. Uh, 
event of the uh, radionuclides in the atmosphere. Um, of course, you'll, you'll know that there's been a recent paper um, indicating a potentially larger one about 9,000 years ago, uh, yeah. using similar kind of data, I think in, um, in Antarctic uh, ice cores. One of the things that I thought was surprising about that is the claim is made in this later paper that those events, both events would have occurred near solar minimum. Mm -hmm. And if that's true, that does that then indicate it might be an entirely different kind of solar phenomenon than we've been accustomed to up till now? Because I think the very large CMEs and large solar flares tend to occur near solar maximum. You think of it being exclusively, but certainly there's a high uh, priority of that. So does the much larger magnitude of those events, the 780, and I think it's a 7,700 before the common era, uh, at the time of solar minimum indicate that there may be another form of outburst in the sun that we have hitherto been unaware of and that might have an impact. I, you made the good argument that this wouldn't affect climate but it could affect the short-term effects mm -hmm. of weather on Earth. Yeah. Thank you for mentioning it because I was hesitating to bring this up and you said it in a much better way than I could have done it. <laughs> so uh, I think it's this is really telling us it's not the end of the story and there are people have much more expertise than I do working on this. And I think here clearly I have to admit that the, it's still an open question. Indeed, it's very puzzling. And I find it fascinating because it's really telling us that uh, this is not the end of solar physics. <laughs> Definitely not. We have quite an extreme question, I would call it. And uh, the question is, what solar flare magnitude would be needed to cause extinction on Earth? <laughs> oh, if you want numbers, um, then you... Um, I wouldn't be able to, to tell this. This is something that can definitely be quantified. There have been a bunch of teams, actually even EC teams, um, trying to, to investigate this. The, I think it's a very interesting physical question because it really boils down to what is the, the largest size of um, um, active region you can have on the sun and, and, and just the maximum amount of energy you can store in this active region before it gets released. And to this, I would really refer to, to the teams who worked on this. Uh, there was a team by um, with different people. I remember Ed Kleiver, Karl Schreiber, and, and others. And I think there is a much more accurate answer to be found there. And I would like also to give a comment on one of the, what is written in the chat here, which is from Ilan. He's writing there regarding habitability and risks to humanity due to electromagnetic radiation. We should add possible stars, magnetars, and earthquakes all these kind of things. I would like to mention gamma ray bursts and supernova. I would like to mention that there was already a talk exactly on this from C, C, um, P Ram. So I invite, mm. uh, invite also the other listener, especially to Elon, who is asking this question, to go to our online Game Changer seminar series and pick the talk by uh, C. P. Ram. So we have one more raised mm. hand, which is again, Steven Spangler. So please ask your question. Billy, can you unmute? Oh yes, no, I don't really, I don't really have anything more to say. I guess my hand was still up. <laughs> oh, <okay>. uh, <laughs> since, I, since I'm unmuted, I will say the referring to the issue about supernova explosions and effects on Earth. There was an article in Sky and Telescope magazine in the last ten years where they did an analysis of that. And actually, the Earth's atmosphere is a very good shield against these things. And I think that it would have to be within something like 10 parsecs to produce a lethal effect on Earth. This is far outside of my mm. expertise. But uh, there have been people that have, wor have worried about that. And so mm. normally, supernovae are going to be much, much further away than that. Um. Um, so I think that there's um, uh, Dieter Breitschwert, of course, has found evidence of supernova explosions from sediments on the sea uh, sea bottom. Uh, but I think they're all just way too far away to be um, of any impact. Now, if you go back billions of years, it might be a different story. Mm -hmm. Now I will lower my hand and shut up. 
<laughs> Sorry, I, I was thinking, well, he will ask a second question, but I didn't you know, realize that they were still. Okay, so we have one more call. Well, we have several questions, and the chat is really full also with question answers and comments. But there is one more question about the 11 year cycle observed by Williams in Canadian sediments, if this has been observed elsewhere. Um, there's an interesting paper by Barry Pittock, which is from the 1980s where he lists all those coincidences between the 11 year solar cycle and 11 year cycles observed in, 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 at Earth. And he mentions different examples, which are not all very convincing, but there are definitely more examples in his old papers to be found, yes. But again, I, would, I, would don't, I don't want to give the message here that because there's this 11 year cycle, it should be the sun. There are so many different mechanisms, including the natural cycles in, in, in the climate system, especially when continents move around, you can change quite substantially the periodicity of these cycles. So let's be very, very careful here. <laughs> so I think uh, there are so many more questions. Well, let, let's still read the last one and then we will stop here with, um, with question. It's kind of flare of observed strength potentially damage our ele electronic infrastructure significantly causing immediate disruption of communication commerce. Could such an event be civilization ending? It's... <laughs> okay, that's, that's, that's about the big one. <laughs> um, the different studies that have been, including those that have been led by, by AC teams suggest that, um, okay, let's go back to, to the start. And when you have a solar flare, you have different impacts on the Earth. So the immediate impact is the uh, X-ray, soft X-ray and extreme ultraviolet radiation, which causes ionization of the ionosphere, uh, which ge immediately generates a blackout of uh, radio communications. And this is something that's, that, that is well known. Um, what happens next is that you have these um, relativistic particles that are potentially accelerated by the flare, not necessarily, but usually they are with large flares. If they are directed towards Earth, uh, they can reach the Earth within 45 minutes, one hour, a little bit more. And so these are the dangerous ones, but they, they, are, they are very well absorbed in the, in the upper atmosphere. So very few of these particles of these energetic protons reach the Earth's level. When they do so, uh, this is called the ground level enhancement. And this is something that can be measured on ground by, by neutron monitors. But most of the time they get absorbed higher up where they can be a threat for um, air crew, for example. So if you have a flight going over the polar regions, you are much more exposed to these particles and this can be a major risk. And this is why um, aviation, especially civil aviation is taking these things very seriously today and their prediction centers for, that have been developed for that. Um, what happens next is that um, depending on the, on, on the topology of the magnetic fields, in about one 24 hours, sorry, 24 hours after this flare, you have a, a so-called coronal mass ejection, which, which is the perturbation which is reaching the Earth, and this can cause a major damage. So the, the most dangerous events are those because they perturb the magnetic fields, uh, they generate uh, currents in the ionosphere, which generate induced currents in the earth. And these can cause a lot of damage in the electric circuits. So the event that happened in 1989 in, in Quebec, where there was a, a several hour long disruption in the, electric, um, in the electric power grid, this is something that is generated by CMEs. So CMEs are among all these effects, those that cause the major, most of the damage in, in uh, if I have to, uh, to convert it into cost. And so I'm going back to the, the first question. Could this eventually have an impact on life? Um, probably not, because these particles are absorbed higher up in the atmosphere, which are which is providing a good shield, luckily for us. <laughs> so thank you once more, dear Thierry, for your excellent talk. And uh, I would like to announce the next and, and last in this series uh, se uh, Game Changer Seminar. And it will be on April 7th, and it will be the habitability of galaxies and the spread of life. So uh, we are looking very much forward to see you again online or participating in our series on April 7th. Thank you once more, dear Thierry, and have a nice evening, day or morning. Thank you.
And thank and you all for your note. questions. <laughs> and and, and your take patience. Note, and take note that this will be at four o'clock uh, our time, so an hour earlier than usually. So it will be That's one right. hour early as usual, four o'clock, yes. Thank you, Tilman. Okay. Bye. Bye.